Question number one, which I think we'll uh, try and address, is uh, this. As the West rejects biblical law, justice and morality in favor of a secular ethos, is there a real possibility that the end result, possibly decades hence, could be an eventual takeover by a culturally confident, secure, ascendant, and growing group in the form of Islamic Sharia law? So as the West turns away from biblical law, what is the likelihood of Islamic culture invading? The simple answer is yes. I think you're wanting more of an answer than that, however. Um, I think that there are things that uh, North America uniquely contribute to Christian culture because of our history, but the Word of God does not guarantee that uh, we will be the ones to spread that culture throughout the world in the future, particularly if we apostatize, if we, can, I should say, continue to apostatize and go away from the Lord. Um, I don't think that's going to happen, but uh, when you look at the Bible and how if even his chosen people, ancient Israel, were taken into captivity, I think it's certainly a possibility. Um, Islam, I would say, however, Islam doesn't have many um, intellectual resources. Of course, the U.S. doesn't seem to have any today either. Um, <clears throat> so, um, I'm inclined, again, I'm inclined to think that's not going to happen, but I can't say that it would never happen. It could possibly happen. Islam is very real, as you see right now with ISIS. And it does have an eschatology, and it does have a very positive eschatology, and it does have a means of spreading its gospel, which is not the declaration of the good news, of our good news, um, but the good news of the rightness of Islam. But these guys maybe can give a better answer. I, I just add, I agree with that. I just add to that that um, uh, in some respects, uh, the, the encroachment and the development of Islam in the West is an expression of what uh, Andrew was talking about, which is the cultural retreat and uh, impotence of Christian culture today, is that it doesn't just leave a vacuum. And uh, Sharia law, which is the nature of Islam, is a kind of bastardized version of, of Christian law, and it rushes in to attempt to fill the gap so that there's the problem of now even of um, American, Canadian, Inc British, Danish, and right across Europe. Uh, homeborn radicals flying to the Middle East to take part in jihad, and then in Denmark's case, being welcomed back and uh, with, without any form of sanctions uh, whatsoever. So there is a uh, the, part of the reason for the growth and development of Islam is the retreat of the, the Christian faith. But the problem that in Islam has, along with the lack of intellectual resources, is it's inherently uh, self-destructive tendencies, it's so riven with um, division and murderous intent that uh, it cannot seem to, uh, uh, I mean, ISIS is killing Muslims all over the Middle East. And uh, this will increasingly expose, I think, the, uh, the nature of uh, Islam. And, and, and that's why cultural stagnation has always been the reality for Islamic culture, where it hasn't been able to absorb Christian peoples. Okay, Joe uh, briefly mentioned uh, millennialism as a recent phenomenon that has served to lead the church away from a full-orbed understanding of the gospel of the kingdom. Can you just elaborate on that, Joe? Okay, um, just very quickly, uh, uh, I, I talked about both liberalism and then um, millennialism in the, in the, uh, uh, the sense of the modern uh, renewal, but essentially contemporary renewal of the idea in the 19th century uh, of a uh, literal thousand year reign uh, of Christ from uh, a theocratic center in Israel, in Jerusalem, um, that would be um, imminent. And uh, this was especially popularized. Of course, we understand that premillennialism has had a, a history throughout the life of the church, although it was rejected by the Reformation. But uh, the, uh, essentially, essentially the growth of dispensational theology, which was a mid-19th century phenomenon, came out of the Plymouth Brethren in England, 
and then uh, was exported to North America, and there were various millennialist movements here in Canada, the Campbellites, the Millerites, um, and the Dispensationalists, and they held their camps um, throughout Ontario, especially in the Niagara region. And there were seasons where farmers weren't even bothering to plant crops um, because the end of the world was predicted several times uh, during the 19th uh, century. And uh, what that t tended to do, one of the problems with this rise of millennialism in the form primarily of dispensationalism was that it tended toward cultural inactivity. If the, if the world is going to hell in a handbasket, as um, Andrew was pointing out, and it's just destined to continue to go down, then the hope that uh, dispensationalism offered in, in the form of a, an interpretation of history was that our only hope or our best hope was escape from the world, escape from creation via a secret rapture, uh, not the restoration and reclamation of all things in terms of the gospel. So it's not that we reject the idea of the millennium. The millennium uh, is a biblical concept, but it was seen uh, in Augustinian thought through the Reformation as the period between the resurrection of Jesus Christ and his second coming, a period, the, the church age in which the gospel was going forward and most anticipated tremendous progress for the gospel. That's actually how the dominion of Canada was formed. He shall have dominion from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. The motto of Canada uh, held out something of that eschatological hope, as of course the Puritans did in the United States and as informed many of the Puritans in England during the time of um, the English Revolution. So the issue is, is that if the, the primary problem is if we see ourselves and history as simply going down under the conquest of Satan, the late great planet church, uh, planet Earth, uh, and all of that kind of stuff, and the left behind uh, with Tim LaHaye and so on, um, if that is the destiny of history, then what that tends to do overall, not always, but overall in people's minds is to say that, that our hope is to escape from all of this not to engage in the application of our faith to every area of life. It would be unfair to say that that was true across the board in every individual case, but the overall tendency of that approach to things has moved in that direction. i just add quickly that Christian culture necessitates a sense of historical continuity and not great catastrophes happening all the time. The idea that God is at work slowly, patiently, patiently because we're sinners, in history working out his plan. That's not especially compatible with catastrophic eschatologies. It seems to, de seems to deny to me the work of the Holy Spirit in history, and uh, that's the significance of that as well. So there's a theological problem with the view, it seems to me. Yeah. How do we live with integrity when we are all in one way or another receiving the benefits of socialism, whether it's health care, disability payments, etc. How do we extricate ourselves from a system that is so pervasive now? Well, we are to a degree living under a curse and we can't just sort of escape uh, from that culture. And uh, we have to work to reverse it. Remember, we are not revolutionaries, we're reformers. Some people, they know these truths and they say, well, I'm just going to opt out. I'm just going to go to the, what's way up north of the Arctic, way, 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 way up there. And I'm going to, are you ready? Get off the grid. <laughs> no one's going to find me, and I'm going to be a good Christian. But actually, God has called us to be faithful in difficult circumstances. And I must admit, at times, yeah, you're going to have to have, in the U.S., it's a Social Security card. You have like a national ID card here or something like that. Yeah, okay. Yeah, sometimes you're going to have to participate in that. That is not of itself a sin if you're not supporting it and trying to enhance it. But you do have to work within the system in which God has placed you. God has placed us at this time historically, not at another time. God has placed you, almost all of you here, in Canada, not some other place. So that entails at times living within an unjust system and participating in it, as Daniel did, as a matter of fact, and as the three young Hebrew lads did. So just consider that. That's not to support the evils of the system, but we do have to live in it while trying to change it. It seems to me on this front that uh, that's entirely correct what Andrew just said. At the same time, we're called upon to be distinctive, to be the salt and light of the world, and we're not going to be doing that by being in an ocean of fresh water and a few droplets of salt. So we do need to 
set up at least parallel institutions that are distinctively Christian, and those are pretty clear from the history of the church. If we are in, uh, we can dispute whether we're in a pagan era. Uh, C.S. Lewis does. He thinks that it's impossible for a divorced man to go back to being uh, a virgin, uh, for instance. So a culture can't go back to being uh, the way it once was. There's now an anti-Christian spirit to our age. Uh, but there are similarities and things we can learn from history on, on this front, and that the early church did set up its own uh, health agencies, its own welfare agencies, its own courts of uh, arbitration, its own schools. Those are obvious areas where the church ought to be operative in our day. And uh, that has a twofold benefit. One, it actually... Uh, and it, I'm assuming that these places have integrity in their operations, and that's a necessity to think through, and we're trying to help you do that. Uh, if they do that, then they will produce Christians and distinctively Christian entities which will themselves testify to the goodness of the gospel to those who aren't in them. Uh, and at the same time, it will also allow, it will equip the people that come through them to be able to be the salt and light that we want them to be. You can't be salt and light when you're five years old in a public school, I'm sorry. Uh, particularly if you're, as Andrew said, uh, in, living in this sort of spiritual retreat uh, in your, you know, interiorizing the faith and not even willing to speak out in the workplace yourself for fear of repercussions, well, how do you expect your five-year-old to do so? It's, it's absurd. So setting up a, uh, a, an institution alongside the public school, for instance, uh, will, first of all, draw more people out of that system, and it will allow you to... It, parents will then want to defund the public system, which I think will reduce the size of the state, and that's part of its power. So now, now that, as I said, that's a reformation tactic, not a revolution tactic. That doesn't mean that it's going to be received well. I think as, this, as Christians do this, there will be a backlash against that, and all sorts of slanderous accusations will come forward. But it... it but there's integrity in the position, there's integrity in the action, and that's what matters. And we'll leave the outcome to God on that front, yeah. And one of the most radical things we can do in response to the pervasive socialism is to tithe. Sure. Jesus said, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, but give to God what belongs to God. And the church used to fund all of these things through the tithe. Now, if we don't tithe, which is God's tax, I mean, he owns all things, and he requires a small portion to be returned to him for the extension of his kingdom work. That's how these things are funded. If we don't tithe, and the evidence is in North America that you collect up all the tithes of North American Christians, they amount to about 2%, uh, then how can we expect to have Christian hospitals, Christian schools, Christian universities? They all were Christian. Then they were captured. They were stolen from us, basically, by stealth. In order to restore those things... Uh, it is the patient, long-term uh, faithfulness of Christians. And as you give to God what belongs to God, it's amazing Caesar starts to get smaller. Right now, he seems really, really big. But if you give to God what belongs to God, Caesar becomes smaller. Actually, there's a few questions here about uh, the tithe, the tithe in the Old Testament as well as uh, somebody has written here, you said the tithe at one time took care of the social needs of the populace. Is it the case that the church abandoned this responsibility and therefore forced the hand of the state to take over social needs? How did that, did the cart come before the? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Actually, or both would that, have already, would that have already uh, been in the state's plan? Well, I think there's a growing state on the one hand and an irresponsible church on the other. And it's what we call mutually reinforcing. Excuse me. So I think the, the flip side of that is that we ourselves have to start employing the tithe and using it for all of these charitable, charitable purposes. And as a result of that and other factors, I think the state, as one of you said, will get, get smaller and smaller and smaller. But the answer there I don't think is an either or, but a both and. Okay. Both a growing state and an irresponsible church. Okay. Yeah, the, the welfare state was envisioned, and Scott may be able to speak to this, uh, by um, uh, 19th century utopian thinkers. Many of the things that uh, we now take for granted were envisioned by utopian humanists dreaming about a golden era for the 20th century. It didn't quite turn out to be that way, uh, did it? Um, but it was a mutually reinforcing situation where the impact of what you've heard about today, the enlightenment on the church, 
The church was retreating from its res social responsibility. And as I said in my uh, opening lecture, social financing has to be provided. The question is, how is it to be provided? Now, of course, the more the family collapses, which is the primary social institution that preserves people from poverty, from criminality, academic failure, and all of those things, the more we work against the family, the more the state has to step in as the surrogate father uh, to uh, uh, parent the culture, the more, the bigger the state becomes. And then, as soon as you start to draw the state in, or try and draw the state in and rain debt in, people are furious, and like angry teenagers, they uh, rampage through the street. And so, uh, this, is the, th this is the difficulty. Now, um, as Andrew said, it was a both-and situation. Now, the only way to recover it, he who pays the piper calls the tune, is for Christians to fund these things in the name of Christ. I often give this illustration very quickly. When we do missions as traditionally conceived, and, and we send out missionaries to different parts of the world, what do they do when they get there traditionally? Well, you know, the, the pictures that you see when the missionary comes back and shows a video or shows their, if they're very old, shows their slideshow uh, to the church about what they've been doing. They build schools, they build hospitals, and they establish churches. And what do we do? None of the above, basically. I mean, we stick a gym on our existing church so that we don't have to use the gym down the road, you know, or we just build ourselves a bigger barn. Uh, but we don't do the things that we send our missionaries out to do because we've assumed the myth of neutrality, that all these things that already are in our culture are already Christian. And we need organizations like International Justice Mission to be flying around the world, intervening with the law in various cases, fighting for people's rights. And what do we do here? Just let the human rights tribunals take their course. So the very things that we do when we send out our missionaries are the things that we don't do here. And I think that's a problem. We have to start to refund the things that we believe the Christian church is called to do. Okay, somebody has sent a text by rotary phone. <laughs> and uh, the question is coming from somebody who uh, doesn't want to be... Um, He's saying, I, I reject pietistic retreat, but also political activism. So he's saying, Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world, which I believe is both an encouragement and a warning. I believe our mission is to make disciples and teach them to be salt, light, yeast, etc., and thereby influence the culture relationally, not politically. When the church is the church, we have a profound and paradoxical influence when we seek political power, we are weak, i.e., it's like pushing on a rope. We need to renounce fleshly means to godly means. So I chatted with the fellow a little bit, and I think the concern is, and, the, and maybe what other people are wondering is, uh, how does one balance this uh, between the need for uh, personal transformation by the gospel and then this view of sort of top-down political influence. When Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world, he means its source is not in this world, but it's from God. Actually, that question and idea is understandable because when people hear the term politics today, they only can hear it in modern terms, which is essentially capture all of the power at the top, particularly at the national level, and sort of impose a Christian agenda. But that's not the biblical idea of politics. The biblical idea is a radically localized version of politics. And that's what we're talking about. Essentially, I guess in many ways, what we're talking about is depoliticizing politics. Not getting rid of the state altogether, anarchy, but depoliticizing. So we want to elect people to political office to make politics less important than it's supposed to be. That's what we're really after not simply to capture the levers of the political machine to force people to be better Christians. That's the responsibility of the Holy Spirit using voluntary organizations like the church and like the family. So I think it's maybe a misunderstanding and maybe we have, or at least I haven't communicated it well enough when I talk about redeeming politics. It's not sort of a national top-down bureaucratic politics. Two things. Um, 
firstly, we're talking about, when we're talking about politics, we're usually talking about government of some sort. And when we think of government, we think of national government and the big picture and all-inclusive. And that's partly because we're the product of our age when that's the emphasis. But government really begins with the governing, governing yourself. You can't have a civil society without people acting, uh, reining in their desires and passions and you know, obeying the laws. You can't have that. So government really in the Christian sense means governing yourself. And that begins on an individual basis, but then it's going to be on a familial basis and so on. So that is, when we talk about uh, politics, it's really the application of people governing themselves in a certain way, working together to affect a broader culture, and that is, I think, what's being talked about. The second thing, though, is we need to look at what the entirety of Scripture, we saw at the beginning, uh, Scripture begins in a garden, it ends in a garden city with a culture, uh, and there are, there's still a garden within the city, so the two, to some extent, fit together. But there are also two cities in Scripture, and those are in the book of Revelation. There's the uh, Babylon the Great, and then there's the heavenly Jerusalem. Those are the two cities that are there throughout human history. Uh, and Christians are called to be that city in the midst of the city, as Daniel was in Babylon, uh, just as uh, uh, the early Christians saw themselves within Rome, Rome being at that point the new Babylon and encompassing the entire empire of the world. So I do think, Paul, and in our day, we live in democracies for the time being, and we're required, I think, or obligated to act in accordance with it, not because we're not revolutionaries, but reformers, and it, we're called to act politically, not to seize power, but to transform uh, government through our self-government. We're not asking people to do things that we think we ought not to be subject to ourselves. So it's not, there's no cultural vendetta that's not the application of group identity politics, Christians are going to be in charge. We're not talking about a caste system of Christians on top and then non-Christians below. It's the same standard for all because there's one law and we're all under it. Yeah. I would just add that, um, yes, what Andrew said there is very important. Jesus didn't say my kingdom is not in this world. He says it's not of the world or from the world. It's source of authority and power. That's why Pilate said to him, so you are a king then. And Jesus says, you say I'm a king. And for this purpose, I came into the world to reveal the truth. Pilate asked the, asked the question about what is truth. So don't forget the gospel is the gospel of the kingdom. That's what we're announcing. And it, there's no such thing as a kingdom without a king or an authority or regency or power. Now, the issue that I think we need to be careful about here is that there is nothing evil about power itself. You need power to get out of bed. Right? You, 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 need, you need power to go to work. Uh, we all need power of one sort or another. Now, the question is, what's the source of our power? And what is the source of authority? And uh, for the Christian, power is service. That's why, actually, in the West, we call our politicians ministers, the prime minister, the ministry of corrections, because it was supposed to be service under God. The diaconal role of the state, as outlined in Romans 13, is to be God's servant, so power, when uh, grasps for um, godless means, is, of course, dangerous. But power put into service of God is service, which is what stewardship uh, and culture-making is all about. I think the problem is that narrative of power and oppression has been so... Uh, we've so uh, soaked it in in our culture that, you know, the, you've got the, the, the powers, and it's all about oppression and power and control and domination that we've lost the Christian understanding of power as service. That's why Jesus could, as the Son of God, take the towel and wash his disciples' feet and say, and do this for one another. For whoever wants to be great among you must be the least. So our public, that's why we call it public service. Now, humanism doesn't see it that way. The humanistic state, the statism of our era, does believe in power for its own sake, not power for service, power to exercise power, control, social science, social control. That's the purpose of modern politics. Christianity is not about social control. It's about service to God. Now, it's a false dualism to say that as Christians, then Christians shouldn't really be about um, being in politics. Po the, the, the state is only the differentiated public serving the public good, serving those it represents. So Christians should be interested in serving their communities. 
serving the public good, not for their own power to exercise lawless power, but to serve God. That's the nature of the Christian state, and I think that's where we have to make a critical distinction in our time, is that that's what the elite humanists and pagans of our era want. They want power and control to ordain and predestine their own future. That's not what the Christian wants. The Christian wants to serve God in terms of his word and serve our neighbor. And this is all very practical, too. And what happens if a politician, what do you call your, your national assembly, a national like, parliament. so parliament, a, parliament, a parliamentarian. So what happens if he or she becomes a Christian? He's going to come to Joe and say, well, I'm a Christian. How should a Christian act now? So he's not going to think, well, Christians shouldn't like be involved in politics. He's going to try to give a distinctively Christian answer to this person, a very practical answer. So that's trying, not trying to take over politics. These things actually happen. There are Christians, believe me, there really are, that are involved in state and national and political office. They have to ask themselves, how should I distinctively act as a Christian? So these are very real practical questions, and we have to be the ones by God's grace that help to provide them. We, meaning not us up here, but the Church of Jesus Christ. Uh, I have a number of questions here that really have a common uh, thread running through them, which is um, your, your pastors, educators and pastors, and uh, when we uh, are operating by sight, well, the thing just looks hopeless. Uh, what, what is the way forward then? Like, what is a pastor uh, to do? Uh, how am I to talk to my friends so that I could begin the process of... It just looks insurmountable at times. I'll, I'll tell you, I answer that by three simple words that I tell people all the time. It's so simple, it's so powerful. It is this, God blesses obedience. It looked insurmountable for Abraham. What, I'm gonna like about 100 years old and I'm gonna have a like, not just a kid, but my descendants are gonna like be as great as the stars in the heaven. Yeah, right, his wife even laughed at God over that issue. We have to, and this happens, this idea happens again and again in the word, God blesses obedience. Tell people, I mean, that's the test of faith. It's not a test of faith when everything looks great in a society, when Christianity is predominant. That's not necessarily a special test of faith. The test of faith is faithfulness in times like ours. God blesses obedience. I didn't want to uh, laugh out loud because I don't mean to ridicule the question, but I, I once uh, walked in the darkness. I came to faith in the first year of my PhD. That was hopelessness. Uh, and I wonder sometimes for people who've grown up in the church and who are seeing uh, the darkness that's spread around them, if they really recognize what the darkness is. Uh, because I came out of the darkness. I get that's the darkness. I see the light of the Christian faith. Uh, and there's great hope in it. And uh, I, I don't share the pessimism. I have just analyzed in my talk uh, the nature of the depravity, where it's come from, et cetera, and how it's taken over things. Uh, it's sort of like what Joe said about Islam. There, it, it has no fuel of its own. It's a parasite. It feeds on the good things of the gospel, but it offers nothing itself. It has nothing to give, and it cannot uh, bring anything but that. And it will turn. All these identity groups hate one another. Don't think that the gays and the, and the women's rights groups like one another. They hate each other. Uh, in particular, the, the uh, homosexualists, they despise women. Uh, that's precisely why they were where they are. And the, the Muslims that are in the alliance, they hate them all as well. There's nothing that unites them except their uh, an, uh, antipathy to the Christian faith. Um, so don't think that the divided house that you are facing is in any way united. This is just superficial. So stand and believe. That's what I say. When uh, the um, friends of Daniel uh, saw the massive statue that Nebuchadnezzar had erected in uh, the Babylonian Empire. It looked pretty bad. The odds looked pretty bad. Who would have thought that later Nebuchadnezzar himself would be repenting and mandating worship of the living God? The Roman Empire, massive in its extent, uh, pagan to the core in 300 years, having crucified Christ in 300 years, its emperor is turning to him. Now, when in the upper room 120 people are gathered, you know, huddled together as a small band of believers, do you think they could have ever imagined the spread of the gospel? 
Do you th I mean, it, it would have been uh, very difficult in that situation to imagine as a tiny persecuted group, persecuted by the Romans and by your brethren, the Jews, as a sect, the followers of the way, uh, that there was any hope. You know, it's actually what Scott points out is so important there in, in Ephesians. Paul says that men are without hope and without God in the, in the world. We're not the ones without hope. Now, it is true that the sins of the fathers there are visited to the third and fourth generation, but the promise of Scripture is that his blessing is to a thousand generations of those who love him and obey his commandments. So if we trust and obey, as Andrew was saying, we have to have faith to believe that God is still God, and he is going to bring fruit from our faithfulness. We don't walk by sight. We walk by faith.